It's funny, isn't it, how music is prone both to fashion and to habit. Some pieces come into fashion briefly and disappear. Some have been published for so long that we're never going to let them go. And then there's the issue of vocal layout. So if something's for a modern SATB, that's always going to do, it's always going to be more possible than something that isn't. So Birds Ave Verum Corpus works beautifully for that lineup, whereas Birds Deus Venerent Gentes, which is one of his greatest pieces, uh, tends not to do so well. Uh, written for S A A T B or maybe A T T bar B, uh, 13 minutes long, enormous ranges, and dealing with the bodies of the saints being hung out for the birds to peck at. Uh, never going to be classic evensong fare, is it? Uh, add to that, English singers at least tend to avoid singing in foreign languages except Latin, uh, and people don't seem to meet to sing sec secular music for its own pleasure anymore. So part of the point of this series has been to try to address that a little and to open eyes and ears to the sheer variety of Renaissance secular music out there, while not having to bother about getting a balanced ensemble ready because the other singers are already provided on the track, uh, and generally to encourage more people to engage in one-two-apart ensemble singing because ladies and gentlemen... The greatest rapture in my life was afforded me the boat in Nassau. Singing Monteverdi Madrigals and Tompkins. And it's to an absolute gem of Tonkins that we return to today. Tonkins was born in 1572 in St David's, Wales. In his youth, he moved to Gloucester, where his father was a minor canon at the cathedral there. In 1596, aged only 24, he was appointed organist to Worcester Cathedral. But there was clearly an awareness of him in London, as Thomas Morley included quite an involved madrigal of Tonkins in his 1601 collection, The Triumphs of Oriana. He probably spent the early years of the 17th century between Worcester and London. He was appointed one of the organists of the Chapel Royal in 1621. His 1622 book of songs for three, four, five and six parts was published just after that appointment, and unusually every single piece in the collection is dedicated either to a member of his family or a composer colleague. The thing about this book, which is mostly of secular pieces, is its sheer invention. Now, we've seen that in Monteverdi's fourth book of Madrigals from 1603, which we've dipped into three times in this series already. Uh, the pieces in that book are so different from each other. Uh, and it's true here as well, nowhere more so than the four songs for four voices. We've already featured Was Ever Wretch Tormented? Uh, that was Sing the Score number five, All Pleasurable Dissonance. Do go back and have a little look at that one. Then there's Oh Ye Has Any Found a Lad, a highly virtuosic and a rather Spike Milligan-esque poem. There's Oh Let Me Live and Oh Let Me Die, which flows with an almost instrumental sense. We'll be singing that one together at Sing the Score Extra. If you want to join us for those sessions, just email us. Uh, you could even make Saturday the 13th at 11am if you email me pretty swiftly. But today it's the trickiest of all the four-parters. Weep no more, thou sorry boy. It's quite a mental workout, but absolutely brilliant to sing. Its two parts are dedicated to his two brothers, Peregrine and Robert Tompkins. Is love and the boy Venus and her naughty son Cupid? Seems a bit too earthy for them. My friend Claire wonders whether it's an older, more experienced person warning boys of the conflicting emotions that love can bring. Weep no more, thou sorry boy. Love's pleased and angered with a toy. Love a thousand passions brings, laughs and weeps and sighs and sings. If she smiles, he dancing goes, not thinking on his future woes. If she chide with angry eye, sits down and sighs, I me, I die. Yet again, as soon revived, joys as much as late he grieved. Change there is of joy and sadness, sorrow much, but more of gladness. Then weep no more, thou sorry boy. Turn thy tears to weeping joy. Sigh no more, I weep, I die. But dance and sing and tee-hee cry. Tee-hee indeed. 
So we've got very quick changing conceits and ideas, and Tompkins is very specific in his response to each of them. But I think the big achievement of this piece is that at the end it doesn't sound like a series of bits, but like a whole. Uh, should we look at the mode? Well, I don't know about that. Modes describe tone and semitone patterns common to plain chord melodies. Oh, exactly, Richard, that's right about plain chord. And while composers of medieval and renaissance benefited did try very hard to make them work in ports, it's hard to get past the basic problem that when you have more than one vocal line sounding at the same time, you're going to get tritones between them, which frankly isn't going to help anyone. And to avoid that problem, you have to add sharps and flats, which take you out of the mode. So it's a pretty good effort there by your average 16th century composer, but I can't see it affecting the result. Right. Um, in 1556, for two, Hermann Fink, the German theoretician and all-rounder, uh, claimed that composers can't in any case keep to the mode because they have to be free to express the text by using notes outside the mode for colour. Um, but the old idea that each mode had a character to it certainly seems to have stuck. Um, Weep No More is based around the note of D, with one flat in the key signature, and that gives us a mode that goes which is the Aeolian mode, a favourite of composer William Byrd for texts of lamenting. But it's weep no more, so as soon as we're on to no more and the weeping stops, Tompkins changes to something jollier, a nice D major. But then makes it up to us with a suspension whose dissonance expresses the idea of weeping again. Love's pleased and angered. And listen how the word angered really sticks out, partly because of the modulation away from the centre of D to F and then E flat but actually rather more because of the very bold way it set that ang sound all four singers together. With a toy, and because it's a toy, it needs to be played with. Laughs and weeps. Chromatic. Nice. Again, please. Lots. So over one little phrase, he's gone from E flat major, seven steps around the circular fifths, to E major. Or the way he's done it, just through two tertiary shifts. then sighs, and after the Italian fashion, sets that word with gaps between them so that you've got time to sigh on the rests. Singing gets fast notes, like someone singing. While smiling is rather intriguing. Look at the shape of the notes on the last few notes of the word smile. They make a smile shape. It's the sort of thing that composers did. The Germans have a name for that sort of descriptive writing, which won't be heard, but you can see it on the page. It's called Augenmusik, eye music. It may not even be intentional here, but the bass part, which should really be if she smiles, she smiles, in the mode, actually smiles that fourth note, a B flat, up to a B natural. If she smiles, she smiles. He dancing goes, and it trips into triple time. On if she chide, we hear the nagging. Then she sits down. Before a gentle lamenting cadence brings it to a close. But wait a minute, we're off again. Yet again, as soon revived, says Tomkins, and he has to do the phrase twice because of that word again. And then there are some notes for joy. For as late he had grieved, sad suspensions.
We have a time change into three for change there is. Change there is of joy, of joy. Then this plangent A flat major chord on sadness, it just sits there. That phrase started in A flat major, which is four flats in the key signature, but by the end of it was in E major, that's four sharps in the key signature, and a couple of bars later it's in B major, five sharps. Really very advanced and exaggerated stuff, which is well, they'll eat your heart out. And there's plenty more like this which you'll discover for yourself when you're singing it through. Uh, just one last thing in case my head of research at the University of York is watching. Uh, there's a very odd time change into the last section on Tee Hee Cry looks most peculiar. Triple times in the late 16th and early 17th century were generally notated as three semi-briefs per bar. This didn't mean very slow, it was just the convention. But another way you could imply triple time was to blacken the notation, it was called coloration, which then implied three in the time of two. And in this example from Monteverdi's Vespers, what you're looking at are not modern crotchets, but blackened minims or minims in coloration. Tompkins has done both here, which is overkill really, but that's fine. How do you sing it? The relationship between duple and triple time in most classical music is that the small note values roughly stay the same. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. But in this period, it's the relationship between the overall bigger units or the bars that stay the same. So you've got one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, one. The overall pulse stays the same. So here that would be but dance and sing and tee hee hee cry and tee hee hee cry. But back when we recorded this in 2001, I was young and foolish. And we did the triplets um, super fast, so you'll have to sing along like that with the track. However, if you'd like a PDF of this magical, or indeed uh, one of any of the other pieces we've been doing in the series, just send us an email and we can send you a PDF within hours for you to copy and share with friends. This piece has a few tuning issues, bound to if it's going from four flats to five sharps. We've already talked about how major thirds need to be lower than you're used to hearing on a piano, just a fraction, so that they reflect the natural sequence of the harmonic series, which is what makes something sound nice and in tune or not. It's useful to see that in your mind as keeping notes that have a sharp in front of them low, because sharps tend to sit at the top of a major third. Similarly, with minor thirds needing to be pushed a little higher than a piano third to sound nice, generally notes with a flat in front of them are sitting at the top of a minor third, and so they need to be kept high. Sharps low, flats high, the world is on fire! <laughs> Time for the music, but just a gentle reminder to pay a little something for these sessions if you can afford to so that we can keep on making them. All details of how to at ifagilini.com slash friends, and do please subscribe, uh, it's free by pressing on that little button down there, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook, pop across to efagellini.com slash singthescore. You'll find all the episodes of there and you can also subscribe there. Here's Greg with the warning. Okay, dudes, here's the warning. The last triple time section has the text, but dance and sing. But Tomkins starts the phrase on the first beat of the bar, which can make it sound like, but dance and sing. It's not cool to sing it like that, okay? Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it.
Sing, 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 sing,